So, good afternoon. Uh, we will now just continue with the text. We're on page 14 on the um, second paragraph. So, he was saying uh, previously, if you remember, that the teacher gives teachings in accordance with the needs and capacities of his student. So we shouldn't... Uh, ...critical of, you know, different people getting different teachings because, you know, we all are at different stages, we all have different personalities, different needs. So what is good for one person might not be good for another person. It's not that there's just one way for one of everybody. Different people are different. And this is why also the Buddhist tradition is in general so rich. And in particular, the Tibetan tradition insofar as it has many different methods, what they call skillful means, uh, different ways to um, approach the, the, the same realization. It's not just uh, one, one way for everybody. Different people need different approaches. Some people are very devotional, some people are very intellectual, some people like things very simple, some people like things very complicated. Um, it's like that. One time I, I was reading this uh, commentary on the, uh, yeah, of a Sakya, text, you know, the Sakya school, and it was on different methods of tumo. Tumo is this inner heat meditation, which was very popular, you can understand, in Tibet. And uh, although it was started on the, the, as I said, the torrid plains of India, where you do anything to keep cool, but nonetheless, when it got to Tibet, it was very popular, because it kept you hot. And in this uh, commentary on these different Tumo texts, it, just in the Sakya tradition, they said that there were, I think, 16 or 18 different uh, practices, starting from the very, very simple and going through to the extremely complicated and all stages in between. And the advice was to read them all and decide which one we feel most, um, you know, attracted to, and then stick with that. Because, as I said, some people like things very simple, some people like things very complicated, some people like things in between. All of them work. All of them are efficacious, otherwise they wouldn't be part of their tradition. But different people have different needs. So in the same way, um, you know, there, there is a wide variety of approaches. And it's not that one is better than the other. It's just that different people need different things. And sometimes different people need different things at different times. So um, we shouldn't be critical of different approaches because it's not what we were taught. So he says... Do not evaluate or criticize the diverse Buddhist traditions and different schools of thought, or the teachers holding those lineages who appear to be either important or in a humble position, whatever they may be. So that we don't just, um, you know, have devotion to lamas who sit on high thrones and ignore people who are not sitting on the throne at all, or sitting on a very low throne. Our spiritual potential does not depend on the height of a throne. One time I was with one actually very important lama, and it was at one of these big gatherings where all the lamas were decked out, depending, the lamas are terribly into how many cushions you get. Um, you know, on their different levels. And um, he said, look at them all. 
He said, now, if we were evaluated not according to the size of our monastery, but to the level of our realization, some of those up there would be on the floor, and some of those on the floor would be on a high throne. Um, and, and actually, that's true. So we shouldn't evaluate a teacher just by their worldly position but by their inner qualities as far as we can know them. Because some of the most skillful teachers are people that nobody's ever heard about. And, um, you know, others who have, you know, very large organizations and are very well known, maybe their qualities are, you know, not as high as it might appear to be from their, the uh, publicity that they receive. Who knows? We are not the ones to judge. The point is not to judge whether high or low, all of them, if they are skillful teachers, are to be honored. That's the point. We shouldn't judge people by their outer um, manifestations, how many mm, teachers, students they have, how many books they've published, this type of stuff. The skillful deeds that Buddhas and Bodhisattvas display in all kinds of illusory ways in accordance with the inclinations and capacities of those who are to be trained cannot be weighed by the mind of ordinary people. So we, who are we to judge from that point of view? We don't know. We have very ordinary conceptual minds. We cannot understand the extraordinary activities of advanced beings who might appear in very humble forms or might appear in very glorious and illustrious forms, depending on the needs of those to be trained. One time, okay, one time I had a dream uh, about the previous Karmapa, the 16th Karmapa. And he was on a, a throne in a theater with the spotlights all on him. And he was transforming into all the different Buddhists and Bodhisattvas and deities. So he was Chenrezig, then he became Manjushri, then he became Yamantaka, then he became all oh, these one after the other after the other in front of the audience. And I was sort of in the, um, you know, on the sidelines there. And I was thinking in my dream, uh, well, this is very wonderful, but it's a little ostentatious, uh, showing off. <laughs> and then I looked in on the side of the theater, and there was my Lama Kamtarimpache, who wrote this book. Um, and I looked at him, he was just watching Kamapa. And then I saw inside Rinpoche, all the deities were there. And then I recognized that it was the Kamapa's activities on behalf of beings to appear dazzling like that. That was how he benefited beings. Whereas Rinpoche was a, a secret yogi. They, the Kamapa one time said to me, Come to Rinpoche and I, we are exactly the same. When I look at him, I see myself in the mirror. And it was like that. He was a mirror image, but he was inner, and the karmapa, it's his activity. He's a karmapa, right? He, he manifests his activities as a karmapa. Um, and so that's how he did it. He showed his glory, and come to Rinpoche kept it all inside, but it was the same. Depending on what was needed by what was most helpful at that time for benefiting beings. So we cannot judge by the outer appearance. We only can judge by the results of what, how their, their skillful means manifest, if it's skillful or if it's not skillful. And the skillful deeds that Buddhas and Bodhisattvas display in all kinds of illusory ways in accordance with the inclinations and capacities of those who are to be trained cannot be weighed by the minds of ordinary people. We cannot know why they do what they do. 
To see them as good or bad is a sign that one's mind is biased. Do not find fault with them, for if there is no faith, the seed of Dharma becomes rotten from its core. This does not mean that if people are really not acting in accordance, in, they're acting in ways which are harmful for their students, that we do not have to admit that. This is now a big controversial point that um, some lamas have been shown to be very exploitive towards their students, especially sexually exploitive. Do we accept that it's just their skillful means, or do we say, hey, now that you've crossed the boundaries? My feeling is that if it was beneficial and the students feel benefited, then it was skillful means. If they feel humiliated, exploited, and totally confused, it was not skillful means. And most of them feel the latter. So it was not skillful, it was just the Lama crossing boundaries which he should never have crossed. So it doesn't mean we have to be blind. Even the Dalai Lama himself said, if a Lama is acting in a way which is exploitive and harmful, we should expose that. And Mingyu Rinpoche says the same. It's not that we have to close our eyes to bad behavior. If it is helpful, then good. If it is not helpful, then not good. And the criteria is whether or not the students ultimately feel benefited or exploited. So, regard your perception as being perverted by your impure, deluded conceptions sometimes and adhere to this understanding. But, you know, of course, this is a, a, um, a razor edge because on one hand, yes, it's true, you know, we don't see things in, with great clarity because our minds are obscured. On the other hand, we do have our inner wisdom. And we should not ignore our inner wisdom. When there, something inside us is sending out red light, warning signs, we should listen. We shouldn't be stupid. Sorry, Rinpoche, but really. I mean, I was very fortunate because all my lamas were very immaculate. I never had to question any of them, but some people do. In that case, one should be grateful for what one learned from the Lama, and all their good qualities should be recognized and acknowledged, but at the same time, one can step back and say, no, this is not, this is not uh, good. And so we, we should not be naive. So be conscientious and discipline your faith and pure perception so it becomes impartial. But nonetheless, keep your common sense. Really, truthfully. Otherwise, you know, it can, you know, in certain circumstances, lead to a lot of confusion, a lot of doubt, uh, a lot of sense of inner lack of worth and so forth. This is a big problem when the lamas overstepped any, not just lamas, any, anyone in authority who uses their power to um, in any way um, disempower others is not a good thing. I mean, the lama is like a father, you know, that you have to trust your father. Nobody thinks incest is a good thing. When meditating on a deity, reciting mantra and the like, follow the corresponding authoritative texts and be determined to perform them precisely as explained there. So almost all sadhanas, all practices have commentaries that go with it. So if you are, these commentaries are available, read them and study them. If not, then get precise teachings from someone who knows the practice very well so that we are exactly sure how these should be practiced. And that gives us also a confidence that we are doing it right. Do not do your practice casually, the easy way. Once you have taken the commitment to do that practice in retreat, do not allow yourself to be diverted by any other circumstance whatsoever. 
If it's difficult for the attributes of realization to be born in your being, or if the signs that indicate you are close to accomplishing the deity take a long time to appear, do not become impatient or frustrated or develop wrong views and doubts. Stand firm in your devotion, including the three kinds of faith, admiring faith, aspiring faith, and trust. So in other words, once we decide to do a certain practice, and especially once we, normally when we have um, a, a personal deity in Tibetan Buddhism in Vajrayana, then we have to accomplish a certain amount of mantras depending on the number of mantras in, in the number of syllables in the mantra. There, uh, that's usually multiplied by 100,000 for each syllable, unless it's a very long uh, mantra like Vajrasattva with 100 syllables. Um, so then we usually go into a retreat to accomplish that amount of mantras. That is considered accomplishing the deity. And along with it, if we are practicing sincerely, there should be certain signs which come with that. But as he's saying, even if the signs don't come, don't be discouraged, there might be some, you know, obstacles. If we keep going long enough, that will be cleared away and we will gain the accomplishment. And sometimes even if outwardly there doesn't seem to be accomplishment, the blessing is there. I mean, the famous story of that, of course, is um, Asanga and Maitreya. Does anybody know the story of Asanga and Maitreya? Yes, 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 you must know. It's a very famous story. Um, Asanga was in a retreat uh, trying to accomplish Maitreya, the, the future Buddha. And so he uh, was in retreat for six years and he didn't get any signs at all. He didn't even get a good dream. And so he gave up and he wandered off. And then in true Mahayana story fashion, he sees um, somebody who is, what are they doing? They have a big piece of iron and they're rubbing it with a cloth. And he says, what are you doing? And he says, well, I need a needle. And so I'm trying to wear away this big piece of iron in order to make myself a nice sharp needle. So Asanga thought, what a complete waste of time. Well, if he can expend so much energy on such a useless activity, who am I to say? that I, I have expended enough energy on my practice. So he goes back to the cave and he tries again for another three years and still nothing happens, nothing. And so he gives up again, nine years and not even a good dream. Off he goes again and then he sees somebody, there's a big boulder in front of his house blocking the sun. So again, he's rubbing at the boulder, chipping away, trying to get rid of the boulder so the sun will come through. And again, Asanga thinks, what an incredible expenditure of energy on something so futile. When I was at least doing something worthwhile, why am I thinking that my efforts were enough? So he goes back into retreat again. Now it's 12 years, nothing. So he said, this is it. 12 years of Maitreya and nothing. So he goes along the road, he said, I give up completely. So he's walking along the road and he sees this old dog, this bitch, who's lying by the side of the road and her stomach is all open, her intestines are out and it's all being eaten by grubs. And he feels tremendous compassion and he thinks, I must remove these grubs at least from her stomach. But if I pick them up with my fingers, then I might hurt the grub. So I will lick them off with my tongue. But she stinks so much that he can't look. And he kneels down and he sticks his tongue out. And he gets closer and closer and closer and closer and closer. And finally he hits the ground. And then he looks and there's my trail. And he says, well, where have you been all this time? <laughs> Twelve years I've been practicing you, and where were you? And Maitreya says, 
I've always been there since the very beginning. But because of your impure perception, you could not see me. Now, because of all your practice, that has cleared it away, and you could see me as a rotten dog. And then because of your great compassion, that cleared everything, and your pure perception now sees me as I truly am. And so Asanga said, yeah, okay. Mm. And he said, no, no, proof. Put me on your shoulder, take me to the village, and ask people, what do they see on your shoulder? So he takes Maitreya, places him on his right shoulder, goes into the village, and says, what do I have on my shoulder? And everyone says, you don't have anything on your shoulder. And then he meets one old lady who has partially pure perception. And she, he says, what do I have on my shoulder? And she said, Ugh, you have a rotten dog on your shoulder. <laughs> so like that. Guru Rinpoche says, if you think of me, I'm there in front of you. We cannot see the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. We cannot see these beings which are beyond our ordinary impure perception. But we have to have the, the faith and belief that even we don't see them, they are there if we're thinking of them. And so this is very important when we are practicing the total conviction that what we are visualizing is an actuality. Only at our level of understanding, we don't know. We think it's all imagination. But it's not imagination. It's clearing away the, the lenses, uh, which are opaque with dirt, but slowly, slowly, so that we can see clearly how things really are. Make a strong commitment to generate unflinching resolve and constantly maintain it with perfect diligence. We have to... The obstacles are really very tricky and we have to be, make a commitment. Otherwise, it's not going to work. If we sometimes on, sometimes off, it won't work. We really have to make a firm commitment that whatever we are doing in our life, we will do it with, at least we will try to develop awareness. We will at least try to develop kindness. And for those of us who are doing any kind of Vajrayana practice, to bring that Vajrayana practice into our daily life, that's, that's a, any of you who know about Vajrayana will know that at the time of dissolving your deity, then one appears again as the deity. And all other beings likewise are the deities, not just I'm the deity and everybody else is ordinary beings. Everybody is revealed in their true nature so that we gather pure perception, not just to the guru, but to all beings. We think people are ordinary, we think we are ordinary. But that's just a cover for the light. It's like they've got a heavy shade around them, so we don't see the light, it looks dark. But if we could just undo the cover, the light would flood out because the light is always there in every being. This is the problem. We think we're nothing, but we're everything. Each one. This is what Vajrayana is trying to show us. Our true nature. So, make a strong commitment to generate unflinching resolve and constantly maintain it with perfect diligence. This is when you're in retreat especially. You know, you've got to go for it and not get distracted. Supplicate with great devotion to your guru and the yidam, that's the deity, who are inseparable. The guru, the yidam, and the deity are inseparable because the, the lama or the teacher has realized their inner potential. The only difference between us and the deity and the lama is we usually have not realized. We don't know our potential. We think we're ordinary. 
But the, the Lama knows that we are not ordinary and he himself is not ordinary. So this is the point. They, they have realized their potential. We all have the same potential. The difference only is that we haven't realized that they have. And take empowerment. So that means whenever we uh, want to practice a deity, this is to do with Vajrayana, then we have to take uh, the empowerment which allows us to do that certain practice. Admit your weakened and broken samaya if we have any um, un, un, unfaithful thoughts towards a lama, if it is a, a genuine lama, or towards our Vajra brothers and sisters, people who are practicing together, if we get angry with them or upset with them and so forth, then we should uh, regret that very much and, and do practices to repair that because that creates an obstacle on the path. Uh, so, admit our weakened and broken samaya, our wrongdoings, downfalls, and whatever has conflicted with the Dharma, and endeavor to keep our vows, therefore, uh, thereafter. To, to be careful, you know? Accumulate merit by making large amounts of actual and visualized offerings, according to the practice. So in, in the Vajrayana, a lot of it is, is based on visualization. We visualize uh, the actual transforming ourselves and all beings into their more divine form, and we practice also offerings uh, from the, the mind, because ultimately it's our intention what counts. So therefore, even if it's only a visualized offering, not just an actual offering, it also generates a lot of, um, of, of goodness and power and, uh, and merit. So, I mean, those of you who don't know about Vajrayana, ignore all this. But those of you who are involved, you know what we're talking about here. It's, it's very much depending on the power of our mind to conceive an an alternative reality. Without clinging to a self, take all good and bad situations as the path, especially so when you have a lot of happiness and wealth and abundance of property and friends and possessions. Feeling satisfied and delighted with these opens the door through which many subtle obstructing spirits sneak through unnoticed. These will steadily cause a natural postponement of your Dharma practice. You should be able to recognize them and use them as a path. So whether things are good or bad, you know, bad things happen to us, good things happen to us. Now, bad things, on the whole, we are awake to. If something terrible happens to us, we, we recognize that this is an important time to take this on the path, to make, utilize this as, for example, you know, great loss or great sorrow, then we can use this to develop compassion and open our hearts. And when difficulties come, when people are difficult to us, then we can develop patience and understanding. When difficult situations arise, we can open our hearts towards empathy and so forth. So in a, in a strange way, that is less dangerous than when everything goes right. Because when everything goes right, then we can be lulled soothed into complacency. You know, we, we think, oh, look at me, I'm so special, this is my good karma, and, you know, yes, yes, well, you know, eventually, of course, I'm going to practice, but right now, you know, I've got so many nice things happening, and, uh, uh, you know, eventually, you know, when the kids leave home, but in the meantime, I'm enjoying what I've got. And so a lot of wealthy people get thinking that this is going to last forever and that they deserve what they've got and they become like, 
you know, like a cat sitting on a nice, nice comfortable chair, purring, you know, and it's all very comfortable. And there's not such a, an urgency to take this on the path. Do you understand? So it can become a, a, actually an obstacle. Nothing against things going right. Nothing against having all these nice things that he mentions, like happiness, wealth, property, friends, possessions. Nothing per se is wrong with that. That's nice, good. But if it prevents us, if we get caught up in all of that, and then we neglect to practice, because everything's okay, so why bother? Then it's an obstacle. In, in, you, outside you have the wheel of life, right? You must have all seen it there on the wall. And uh, at the top are the God realms. There are 26 levels of celestial uh, happiness, uh, the heavenly realms which are the beginning heavenly realm, they become increasingly subtle, but the lower heavenly realms are quite sensual. Lots of comfort and nice food and everything you wish for appear spontaneously and beautiful goddesses to serve you. This is the male view. Um, so it's all very delightful, but as a result, one doesn't have the incentive to practice because it's already very nice. Why bother? And so therefore the heavenly realms are regarded as being an obstacle on the spiritual path because we don't have that urging to really put forth effort and really try hard to overcome our conceptual mind, because the conceptual mind is perfectly happy and content. So, therefore, sometimes a difficult situation, the human realm is considered to be ideal because we have nice, pleasant things happening and also difficult things happening. So it keeps us on track. But where there's only nice things happening, then, as I say, the the incentive for spiritual um, commitment is very difficult to keep up because there's no, there's no reason for it. We're happy. What's the problem? We don't recognize it's impermanent and that we're still caught in illusion. We're still in samsara. But we're in the penthouse suite, so why should we bother with who's living in the dungeons? So therefore, he's saying that sometimes having everything very pleasant could be more of an obstacle than when we are faced with tragedy, where we are then get that urge to do something, to, to um, you know, deal with our, our pain, our inner pain. When we're too happy, then we don't bother anymore. So, aiming at wealth, with the basis of apparently doing altruistic work for others, is wrong livelihood. And by doing so, there is a great danger of cutting the life vein of our own liberation. So sometimes people get into charity work and you know, altruistic activities, but they at the same time um, benefit from it. They financially and in other ways, they actually are getting a lot out of it. So on one hand, it looks very altruistic, but at the same time, the motive is egoistic. Um, and of course, nowadays, there are all these, these scandals about these NGOs, um, you know, where actually the, the people working for these NGOs who are supposed to be working for refugees and people in, in terrible, dire situations, are actually leading an extremely um, luxurious lifestyle. And much of the money goes for paying for them and not for the, the people that they're supposed to be benefiting. So now there's a lot of um, scandals about this, 
about, whoa, what's happening? You know, I gave my money to feed, you know, starving refugees and it's just going into the pockets of all these administrators of the, uh, these NGOs. It's, it's really very bad. And in fact, it's extremely bad because you are taking money which was given for one very good um, motive and goal and, and using it for one's own self-benefit. So this is especially not good. I mean, it, it's doubly bad. At least if you're, you're working for a big business, everybody knows you're a big business. And it's not like you're, you're working for a charity and yet, um, you know, uh, skimming off or everything from that charity and to go into your own purse. So a lot of people also, you know, in, in India with, um, you know, these big uh, ashrams and things like this, they do charity work. But at the same time, uh, a lot of the people there uh, live very well from that. So in this way, it's very bad, actually. I mean, I also feel bad about it sometimes. Because, you know, if people give money for a certain um, object that should go to that object, it shouldn't go to something else that I fancy it should go to, including me. Try your best to abstain from this and strengthen. You know, when the Lamas first came to India, they were very, very poor. And everybody was uh, very, it, you know, Tibetan Buddhism is very hierarchical. But that time it, it was very leavened out because everybody was poor. Everybody had lost everything. Everybody was in the same boat. And so at that time also the Lamas, they, they had nothing. And so they were living very, very simply. They traveled by public transport, which in those days was ghastly. And uh, they didn't have fancy cars, they didn't have fancy monasteries, they didn't have fancy anything. They lived very, very simply. Even what they ate was very, very minimal. And in some ways, I think they felt much freer. You know, they, oh, now they can just be like ordinary people. They didn't have to maintain their princely... Um, you know, mode of being. And so a lot of them, they were very easy and every going, and they didn't, I never heard any Lama say he regretted his uh, losing his status by, you know, I mean, they were sorry that, you know, precious books were lost, and of course, you know, so many people died and were in prison and all that, they were regretted. Nobody ever mentioned that they regretted not living in a palace anymore. Now they're back in their palaces. So, try your best to abstain from this and strengthen your actions by profound distribution of merit and aspiration. Do not allow yourself to become a Dharma practicer, practitioner like one at the end of this decadent times who is hollow like a taxidermist dummy. In other words, don't just have an outer facade of being a spiritual practitioner and inside we're empty. I mean, this is said to be at the Dharma ending age. That's what will happen. With outwardly, people will carry the form of being a Dharma practitioner, like wearing monastic robes and so forth, or, you know, malas all over the place and, you know, all the, you know, the outer manifestation. Look at me, I'm a Dharma practitioner. But inwardly, there is no genuine understanding, there's no genuine realization, there's no genuine practice, it's all outer show. That is very, very sad. I mean, it's much better not to show any outer manifestations and inwardly have the experience than to outwardly look like the part and inwardly be empty, in the bad sense, empty. So do not allow yourself to merely become a Dharma practitioner like the one at the end of this decadent times, who is hollow, like a taxidermist dummy. Instead, take as an example the liberating lifestyles of past siddhas, siddhas are those who have accomplished, 
and remain in solitude in the mountains. Always check and examine within and see whether your mind is caught in the grip of attachment to the eight worldly preoccupations involving desire or aversion, hope and fear and the like. Enthusiastically take up the hardships connected with Dharma practice. Be capable of ignoring your own suffering. Avoid doing things that will make you feel ashamed of yourself. So that is fairly obvious, I assume. Um, the eight worldly uh, preoccupations or the eight worldly dharmas uh, that we get caught up in constantly is, uh, as it explains on, on page 10, pleasure and pain. That's a very obvious one. We grasp at pleasure and we feel aversion towards pain constantly. You sit in your seat, you feel a bit uncomfortable, we shift. Right? Pleasure and pain. To be aware of that. Gain and loss. So we always want to get and to hold and we grieve when we lose. People, possessions, reputation, anything. Happy when we have and sad when we have not. That's another very, very common one. Gain and loss. Constant. It's all two sides of the same coin. Praise and blame and fame and disgrace. So we want to be praised. We are happy when people praise us or praise people we like. We feel good about that. But at the same time, when people say bad things about us or criticize us or blame us, we feel bad. Likewise, if our reputation is good, we're happy. If our reputation is not good, we feel sad. So always this, this duality is there constant, based on hope and fear. We hope that we are going to receive uh, pleasure, gain, praise and fame, good reputation, and we fear that we will have pain and loss and criticism, blame and, uh, you know, ill repute, constantly. So this we have to recognize in our mind, how we are polarized between our hopes and our fears, all of which is based, of course, on our ego. I mean, ultimately, it all depends on this sense of I, this solid me at the center of everything. This is our main problem. But we cannot just say, okay, then I'm going to drop my eye and be free. Because unfortunately, who is saying I'm going to drop my eye except the eye? So uh, the ego cannot wish itself to be egoless. Right? But through practice, through insight into how the mind works and the deepening layers of consciousness of itself, our sense of I begins to soften and, and to dissolve. We cannot wish it to dissolve. In the meantime, I think the Buddha was very wise. If we look at the stages on the path of how to deal with the mind, he starts by, first of all, learning this shamatha, this, this mind which is calm and peaceful and, and centered and able to step back from our thoughts and emotions so that we are not so involved in the thoughts and emotions because there is space in the mind. 
and at the same time, he teaches meditations on loving kindness and compassion, which start with ourselves. So we are not sending love and compassion to the nature of the mind, right? Our primordial awareness doesn't need our loving kindness. Our primordial awareness is loving kindness. We are sending loving kindness and compassion to our ego. We're sending it to ourself. Because first, in order to travel the path, we need to start from where we are, which is with our conceptual ego-driven consciousness. But so first step is to make that ego into a healthy, well-balanced sense of self, which is then going to walk the path to its own dissolution. If we are psychologically unbalanced, or if we have a, 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 a painful, unhappy, tortured sense of self, we will not be able to practice properly. So therefore we need first to heal ourselves before we can really be of genuine benefit to others. This is why the Buddha said, we send loving kindness first to ourselves, then to others. We can't give people what we don't have. This is often the problem, you know, also with all these movements for peace and things like that. If we don't have peace inside, how are we going to give peace outside? So, first we have to make friends with ourselves. Have a, a inner sense of, you know, sure we have mistakes, sure we have faults, who doesn't? That's not the problem. I mean, much of the path is dealing with our, our, our problems and mistakes. That's, that's what makes the path. If we were so perfect, we wouldn't need a path. But what we do need is an inner sense of confidence that we can walk the path. And we can't do that if we're always at war with ourselves. If we're in conflict with ourselves, we're never going to be able to have the inner confidence which can overcome obstacles. Because we trust in our own inner ability to walk the path. Without that, nothing. It's not just me saying this. When I first met the 16th Karmapa, he said, within five minutes of, of meeting him practically, he turned to me and he said, your problem is you don't believe in yourself. If you don't believe in yourself, who will believe in you? And I had never thought of it before, but when I thought of it, it was true. You know, if we don't really believe that we can accomplish, we won't accomplish. So it's the irony of, like, Buddhism is talking about non-ego. But to start with, we have to have a good sense of ego. We have to have a strong sense of self-confidence. Even Shantideva says the same thing. He says pride and arrogance are um, a mental defilement, but self-confidence is essential on the path. We have to believe in ourselves and make friends with ourselves and encourage ourselves. Otherwise, we'll give up too soon. And low self-esteem, i.e., I can't do this, others can do it, but me, I can't, is regarded as a form of laziness, right? If I tell myself I can't do this, then I won't even try. And so that's laziness. It's not a virtue. 
We have to believe we can do it. Otherwise, we won't. So it is very important, really. So, and he says, enthusiastically take up any hardships connected with Dharma practice. Be capable of ignoring your own suffering. Don't get caught up in self-pity too much. Don't get caught up in all the problems and the obstacles. Think of the goal. You know, when people go on, on marathon runs or when they climb mountains, they don't make a big thing of the obstacles. The obstacles are there to be overcome. Of course there are going to be obstacles. What do we expect? That's why we're in samsara. If it was that easy, we wouldn't be. But all those obstacles are only obstacles if we say obstacles and they are opportunities if we say opportunities, right? We did that before. So, enthusiastically take up the hardships connected with the Dharma practice. Be capable of ignoring your own sub suffering and avoid doing things that make you feel ashamed of yourself. So, you know, we have all done things which we wish we hadn't done and we've all made mistakes and who has not. But nonetheless, we should try to lead a life which doesn't cause us to be full of regrets for what we're doing. That our life should be completely open so that you know, if we think, you know, all the Buddhism Bodhisattvas are looking at us, we wouldn't feel ashamed. That doesn't mean that we can't relax, but it does mean that we shouldn't do things which we know inwardly should not be done. That we should be careful of our mind, of our speech, of our actions, so that we have nothing to regret. And that our, our actions in public or in private are nothing for us to feel ashamed about. That we can be open. If we knew suddenly that there was a CCTV which had been recording everything, we wouldn't care, nothing. Okay, they could see, nothing to be ashamed of. Also in our thoughts. That our thoughts also, if we think stupid thoughts, we can recognize that's a really dumb thought, let's change the channel. We don't have to watch the whole program in our mind. Right? As soon as we recognize this is not a very intelligent way to be thinking, we can change. We have to be the masters of our own mind. And the first way to be a master of our own mind is to know the mind. So we're back again to being mindful, to observing the mind, to knowing what's going on inside ourselves and taking control. Not being controlled by our stupid, discursive mind thinking. We're in control. We decide what we're going to think. Then we will feel so much happier, so much lighter. And we won't need to feel ashamed of anything. Buddhism is all about the mind, taming the mind, training the mind, transforming the mind, transcending the mind. Nothing about what's going on out there, it's what's going on in here. So in that way, we can be someone who is confident of dying without regrets. If in this lifetime we have done the best we can to benefit ourselves and to benefit others, then we die without regrets. Whenever we die, it's okay. No problem. I've used this life meaningfully. This is the important thing. What are we doing with our lives? Are we wasting them yet again? Or are we doing something which has genuine meaning? This is the question. 
Most of us don't want to face our own mind. We're much happier to blame everybody else. It's the fault of the other people. It's the fault of the government. It's the fault of the world. It's the fault of my neighbors. It's the fault of my parents. It's always somebody else out there. But in the end, it comes back to ourselves. What are we doing right now with our own mind? And if we have made sincere efforts in this lifetime to lead a life which is beneficial, then when it comes to die, young, old, whenever, okay, I did what I could, that's enough. And then we die without regret. If we can die without regret, then that's enough. Otherwise, we die and thinking, oh, all those opportunities I missed, I got distracted, I left things out. What have I done? Who have I benefited? So not like that, isn't it? Really using this life meaningfully. Follow in the footsteps of the enlightened beings of the past. So, I mean, all the enlightened beings of the past, like Milarepa and so forth, we can't all be Milarepa. But we can be, you know, do something meaningful. Everybody has their own path to follow. It doesn't mean that everybody, despite what this says, everybody has to go off and live in a cave. But it does mean that we really can nonetheless use this life to cultivate our inner world, to cultivate our mind, where we have, you know, where we see negative emotions like anger and jealousy and greed and so forth, to recognize them and really try to do something about it. We don't have to keep these poisons in our mind. We don't have to be the slaves to our negative emotions. We can transform. And even if we take just one fault and change it in this lifetime, that's already progress. You know, really, what are we doing with this life? It's not just here to have a good time. We're really here to learn something. Somebody said that life is, is the um, schoolroom. It's like a schoolroom. We have to learn. We have lessons to learn in this lifetime. And if we don't learn them, we have to come back and do it all over again. So we might as well learn it now. Pass all the exams. Then we can graduate. <laughs> Although you may have gained the signs of progress in your experience and realization, do not cling to these as being something good and avoid becoming conceited. So, you know, if we practice, sometimes there are two things in uh, Tibetan Buddhism, uh, experience and realization. So experience is the word nyam and uh, realization is tokpa. So the important thing is the tokpa, which is realization of the nature of the mind. But in the meantime, as we go along, we get what are called nyam. And nyam can be anything. Anything which happens to you in meditation, if it's not realization, it's nyam. Um, uh, it can be experiences of bliss, of clarity, of non-thought, or fear, rage, lust. It can be shaking. Some people feel shush of energies, visions. All sorts of things happen. Yum. <laughs> There's a story of uh, one master. I don't know if it was Milarepa. Somebody. And one of his students, uh, he was sitting in front of his cave looking at the sky. And one of his students came flying by and doing loops and, you know, really, whoa, you know, how's this? And so the master called out, yeah, I see you have some yum. Now keep sitting, then you'll get some tokpa. Right? So that's the point, that even flying is just yum. 
It's just experience. It's not, it's not realization. So however great our realization or our experiences are, some people get tremendous experiences. They really think they're enlightened. Don't be satisfied by that. Don't be proud by that. Or don't be frightened by that if they if they are negative nyam. Just recognize this is just the experience of the mind. This is just the play of the mind. Sometimes the demons, sometimes the angels, just the play of the mind. Don't get caught up in it. We we tend to grasp at something because we think, oh, finally something's happening. Wow, this is something really significant. This really shows I'm making progress. And so then that closes it if we're not careful. Or if we get very fascinated by our nice nyam, then we will get more and more and more and it is a, it's a detour. It doesn't take us down. It's, we're going the scenic route and uh, we're not going on the direct path anymore. So it, it's very important that whatever nyam we get, whether they are positive nyam or negative nyam, we don't take them too seriously. We just see it as, you know, manifestations of what's inside our mind. There's so much going on inside. And different people um, manifest different things. Um, for example, somebody was saying, asking today, are the questions and responses of Israelis different from other people? But, for example, Asians, especially Chinese, they have a lot of experience with ghosts and spirits and possession and this type of thing because that's part of their culture. So, therefore, when they start to meditate, these kind of manifestations appear for them. Whereas people who are not brought up in a culture which believes in ghosts and spirits and things, normally wouldn't experience that. They experience other things. So different people, from that point of view, they manifest whatever is in their own subconscious. It's just the subconscious coming out and appearing. So not to take it too seriously. I mean, it's, it's an indication that something is being stirred up, which is good, but not to grasp at that or, or become proud, especially if it's a good thing that we think now we're nearly enlightened. So, therefore, avoid being coming conceited. Even though you may have some good qualities, do not spread the word around. You know, the more I, I meet people who have really, really, really done a lot of practice, the less, it's really true that the less self there is. I mean, I think the last people in the world to spread around their good qualities are those who have really done a lot of practice, like, you know, the yogis and the lamas who go off for many, many years when they were in Tibet. They just don't think about that. They, they, are, they only have devotion to others who are practiced. They don't have, you know, particular concern about themselves and their own practice. They probably don't even mention it. It's not something which is of relevance to them. Their, their, their feeling is towards devotion for others. So anybody who boasts to you about their realizations, I would be very suspicious of. And if anybody tells you they're enlightened, make for the clearest exit. Um, however high your level of confidence regarding the view and meditation, do not overlook the relative plane of the phenomenal world. Outwardly carrying out all your activities with purity, you should be worthy of being a beautiful ornament of the Dharma. So, in Buddhism there are two truths two levels of reality. There's ultimate reality, ultimate truth, and relative truth. So, as long as we view the world through our conceptual, dualistic, egotistic 
mind, we are in relative truth. From an ultimate level, from the primordial level of the mind, that is ultimate. The other is relative, sorry. The other is relative truth. So, for example, um, on an ultimate level, this table is empty of uh, self-existence from its own side. And, for example, you know, llamas and others um, leave their handprints and footprints in stone because they are, at that moment, in an, looking at the, the, the rock from an ultimate point of view, and in that case, it becomes quite soft and tangible, so they leave their handprints and footprints and other prints in the rock. Um, but, on a relative point of view, if one threw the rock at somebody, they would be bruised and harmed. So it's not that the relative truth is not a truth. It is a truth on a relative level. And because we are on a relative level, therefore we have to obey the code of a relative level. So even if a Lama has the ultimate view and sees everything as ultimately empty, still his conduct should be in accordance with the relative level and he should keep ethical conduct and be an example for others. Because how the teacher acts, that's how all his disciples are going to try to act. So if the Lama, you know, drinks a lot of alcohol, you will find his students are all drinking alcohol. If the Lama is very temperate and very careful, the students will likewise try to be careful. So it, even if it doesn't harm the Lama, nonetheless, from the point of view of the example it's giving to others who are less realized has to be taken into consideration. Because, you know, as I say, a teacher's students will naturally want to model themselves on the example being given by the Lama. So therefore, in a way, the Lama has a responsibility to set a perfect example so that his less enlightened students won't go astray and harm themselves by making bad karma, trying to act like a presumably liberated lama. This is the problem. Actually. So he says, um, it may already be appropriate for you to practice outrageous tantric actions, however, you should be skillful at it. For it would not be right if your behavior caused unruly beings of these decadent times who regard the Dharma and people in a distorted way to stray towards the abyss of the miserable realms. So, in other words, since, you know, in, in Tantra, sometimes there are mad yogis. I mean, to be honest, in our tradition of the Drukpa Kaju. We are not famous for our great scholars. We have had a few great scholars, such as the omniscient Pemakapo, but not many. What we are really famous for is our mad yogis, um, of which we are inordinately proud. Um, like Drupa Konlek, Sanyan Heruka, and so forth. Um, mm. So, when one reaches a certain level of pure view, one's conduct is um, liberated. And therefore, one can do with understandingly skillful. Uh, intention, things which normally would not be permissible, especially in terms of alcohol, sex, and so forth, that they are completely free from all the inhibitions set down by society 
of what is right and what is wrong. I mean, they don't go around killing people and things. But, you know, especially as to alcohol and sex and these type of things, which they are understandable inhibitions in society of what is, can be done, what is permissible and what is not permissible. They are free from all those restrictions and therefore, in order to benefit other beings, they exhibit uh, very unorthodox behavior. So, okay, that's okay for them. What Rinpoche is saying is that we sh they should be careful because, as I say, people tend to follow the example of the teacher. And while it might be perfectly okay for the teacher because the teacher's mind is liberated, their students' minds are not liberated and they might end up creating a lot of negative karma for themselves while trying to emulate the conduct of a liberated being like their teacher. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, therefore, even Rinpoche says that um, this might, um, people don't get, get the wrong impression and they stray toward the abyss of the miserable realms because they're creating negative karma, they become alcoholics or sexually promiscuous and create a lot of harm and, and it can be very destructive. So one has to be very careful. Maybe the Lama himself is liberated or not, some are, some aren't, but nonetheless, uh, you know, what kind of example are they giving to others? I remember that one especially unorthodox Lama who is very well known, I mean, he's passed on now, uh, who I knew my Lama knew very well. He had known him in Tibet and he had also stayed with him in Kalimpong when they first came out. So I knew my Lama knew him. And uh, so I said to uh, come to Rinpoche, what do you think of so-and-so? And he thought, and then he said, at that level, it's very difficult to know. Wait 20 years and look at his students. And to be honest, 20 years later, many of his students are top Dharma teachers in, in the West. Some of them became alcoholics and fell through the hole. Some of them became brilliant practitioners and teachers. So, in general, and also in consideration of his books, which have benefited probably millions of people by now, on the whole, it was good. But it is, as I say, a razor's edge. So be careful. Do not be governed by likes and dislikes, attachment and aversion towards the people you know, whether you have a good or bad rapport with them. So, you know, really have an open heart. Be patient, be kind. If we cannot even get on with each other, how do we expect to solve the problems of the world? Harmony is a very important quality. To stay in harmony doesn't mean we have to agree with everybody. Nobody's ever going to agree with everybody. Why should we? I have my views, you have your views, she has her views, he has his views. They're just views. As I said before, don't believe everything we think. Just because we think it doesn't mean it's right. Or it might be right, but they also might be right, you know. What is right? What is wrong? So even if we are with people that we like or we don't like, don't discriminate so much. This is very important for all of us. You know, to be tolerant, to be forbearing, to be friendly to all people. And even if people annoy us to recognize they are objects of patience, or just to have a sense of humor about the whole thing. Because as human beings, we're useless. I mean, yes, yeah, somebody said we should look at the example. There's some Jewish saying about, you know, you should look at the example of ants. Do you know that? 
you know, I mean, and so incredibly harmonious, hardworking, dedicated, not thinking about themselves, really, you know, just completely focused on the good of the whole, you know, ant group. Very, very selfless are ants. So, while we are not aspiring to be reborn as ants, we can nonetheless appreciate their good qualities. You know, they don't argue amongst themselves. You don't see our ants fighting each other. They, they all are working together in harmony. And even if you don't like the ant in front of you, you follow them, you know, that's okay. <laughs> So like that, you know, because we can always find problems with each other. You know, of course we can. None of us are perfect. I'm not perfect, you're all not perfect, nobody's perfect. We have to deal with that, that's okay, no problem. So, as Rinpoche said, you know, don't be governed, don't be controlled by our likes and dislikes, attachments and aversions towards people whether we get on with them or whether we don't get on with them. Stop making that so important. Just, you know, relax. Instead, take hold of all those connected to you by making pure wishes to become of benefit to them. So instead of being caught up in all our likes and dislikes, just have a sense of well-being and kindness towards everybody, not discriminating whether we happen to like them or not. Just wish them well, everybody, whoever. In brief, emphasis is put on the following points which subsume all the preceding instructions. Feel immeasurable joy, faith, and longing, having met the profound path of the unsurpassable mystery that leads to the primordial land of liberation in one lifetime. That means that we have gained um, some in teachings or some access to a path which leads to the nature of the mind. The nature of the mind, uh, our profound, primordial, pure awareness is the unsurpassable mystery that leads to a primordial land of liberation in one lifetime. The only way to be liberated is to recognize our true nature. Once we have recognized our true nature and able to sustain that realization, we're liberated. Because that is a non, as I keep saying, that is a non-dual level of awareness. Most of our awareness and mindfulness is on a dualistic level of subject and object, which is dominated by the ego. But the nature of the mind, the pure nature of the mind, primordial awareness of the mind is non-dualistic, therefore it is egoless. Once we are genuinely egoless, we are liberated. What are we are liberated from? We are liberated from the ego. So, do not let the teachings you have received from the mouth of your holy guru remain at the stage of having merely requested and heard them. Avoid being caught up by doubts and hesitation. Merging together devotion and diligence Make full use of opportunities provided by your precious human existence. Make your own mind your judge. Do not offend the Buddhas of the three times. So your own mind your judge means just be more aware, be more mindful. And genuinely put the Dharma, this, this idea of having a good heart and a clear, aware mind at the center of life, not just at the perimeter. Put the Dharma at the center of the life. So we start with our ethical conduct, being careful not to use anything, our body, speech, guided by our mind, to harm anyone, any being, not just human beings, any being. 
So first we are lead our life harmlessly. We don't kill, we don't steal, we don't lie, we don't use our sexuality in a way which is exploitive and harmful. We're also very temperate with our, um, you know, our, our daily consumptions, especially alcohol, drugs, which, you know, take control of the mind. To open up the heart to be more kind to everyone, to be more patient, to really begin to look in our mind, see which are our main problems, and learn how to overcome and transform those problems, and take up some subject of meditation, and really day by day by day do it. Even if only for a very short time, keep up that continuity. And where the opportunity comes, then do a longer period, especially under guidance, so that we get the real taste of what meditation is all about. And slowly, slowly, we transform the mind. When we transform the mind, our whole life is transformed. And also the life of others who associate with us. The problem is always not out there, the problem is within ourselves. I mean, so that even people who have undergone the most awful experiences, if they can use that for their practice, then they become transformed. So it's very important to, for us, all of us, to really look at the mind. Nothing we can do which is more benefit for ourselves than to others, than to know our own mind. Because, so then, uh, you know, in the Tibetan tradition, um, you know, in nowadays we were talking about how um, in modern times everybody has promote themselves, they have big CVs talking about all the diplomas they've got and all the incredible positions they've held and all the awards they've received and so forth. Um, you know, they, they have to, you know, if you want to get anybody to listen to you, you have to send out your promotion form first. But in the uh, traditional uh, way of doing things, of course, you always undermine yourself. I was saying how in, in the West, you know, these llamas in America, especially, they sit up on their high throne, they say, oh, I'm really stupid, I really don't know anything, I was hopeless when I was trying to study, and I've never really done any kind of meditations, I have no experiences and realizations, but I have this title, and so people invite me to come and talk, so I'll say a few stupid words. And, I mean, some people think, oh, God, he doesn't know anything, well, why bother with him? And others might think, my goodness, somebody can actually stand up there and, and um, confess they don't know anything. You know? So, um, therefore, it, the, the, now comes the uh, official disclaimer. Because in such a deluded person as I, there is neither understanding of the numerous teachings I have heard, nor any real confidence, experience, nor realization has sprung from reflection and meditation. These instructions and words of advice are like a blind man leading others. In addition to not having any special value for clarifying your practice, indeed, this advice will only cause people to criticize me and me to become ashamed of myself. Believing clay to be gold, you have persistently asked me to write this as you specified, which I have done only not to turn my back on your request. And as this work lacks the quintessence of the vital instructions, I beg you not to rely on this alone and kindly bring to your attention the numerous teachings on mountain retreat written by the great saints. In particular, please consult extracting the quintessence of accomplishment, a concise, easy to understand text full of the pith of profound teachings written by Jitra Yishidoji, who was the previous Dujum Rinpoche. 
This instruction on mountain retreat, called the Nectar of the Mind, Wishing for Liberation, was requested by the yogi lama Yishi Rapsel, who offered me a scarf and three coins of silver some time ago. It was written to me by Kasim Donjunima, who comes from southern Tibet, a hollow man of the termination of these decadent times, in the form of a monk, dull and insignificant, who walks at the end of the line of followers of the lineage of real meaning. That's a Dunju. His name was Dunjunima, meaning son of Dunju. Dunju means like real meaning or authentic meaning. Our nunnery is called Dunju Gatsaling, named after previous control. I composed it in the Iron Ox year 1961 on the 18th day of the first month at Kalimpong in the Aryan country of India, at the top of the mountain Duping, in my house Kuchimide Tempotang, the blissful palace of immortality close to the monastery Zangdong Palri, the glorious copper colored mountain. May it cause goodness to become supreme. Okay. So then I think we will just sit and meditate for 10 minutes, which would be nice, and then we'll call it a day. So please just sit nicely. Nicely means feet flat on the ground and backs as straight as you can in the seat you're sitting in. Uh, your hands are either in your lap or resting on the knees. Your eyes can be slightly open or closed, whichever feels best for you. You who want to sit cross-legged, welcome to the challenge. So then, just, I'm not going to guide you, I just want you to know, just first of all, rest the mind, bring the mind into this hall, then into the body, feel the body, the energies in the body, then bring the attention to the breath as it leaves and as it enters, with a special attention to the exhalation as it goes out, that leave the mind open and relaxed and spacious, then naturally the breath goes in and then out, the mind open, spacious. That's all we have to do is breathe and know we're breathing. Any sounds we hear is just sound, let it go. Any thoughts which come up, they're just thoughts, let them go. If we get caught up with our thoughts, as soon as we notice it, bring it back to the breath, no blame. That's all we have to do. Just sit and breathe and know we're breathing. Okay? So... I even have a chimes. So we will just sit for 10 minutes. No, a quarter of an hour. That's a good time. 15 minutes. Just sit quietly, breathing and being aware of the breath with a very spacious, relaxed, but focused mind.
uh, now we will do the dedication. Uh, the on page, whichever, at the end of the book, the beginning of the book, whichever way you're looking at things. Uh, this is the dedication uh, from the Bodhicharya of Shadideva. Thank you, my dear, for organizing everything and everything. You know, I come here, I go yap, 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 and get all the credit. But really, the credit goes to all these wonderful people behind the scenes who have organized everything, volunteered everything, giving up so much time and trouble to make it as smooth as possible for the rest of us all to just come in and sit down and get on with it. So, really, Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you all.